We live in tumultuous times. Rising inequality and a slowing global economy have created problems for developed and developing countries alike. In response to this, China has been building bridges, figurative and literal, under the most wide-ranging development plan of the century. The Belt and Road Initiative has been going for six years now, but what does the international community have to say on the progress made thus far? And how do experts at the Belt and Road Studies Network answer the concerns the initiative has brought up? This is Xinhua Special, I'm Roisin Timmins. In the run-up to the second Belt and Road Forum, more than 200 experts and scholars gathered for a session of the Belt and Road Studies Network. The meeting was focused on providing a platform for an exchange of ideas that might aid policy making related to BRI. And one of the first questions that comes up concerning the Belt and Road Initiative is China's motives. It's not a club. It's, it's, it's a, a set of relationships, a set of linked projects connected with each other. That's my understanding. In that sense, of course it's very inclusive. It's much closer to being a community than to being an organization. These Belt and Road initiatives will shape the way of globalization to be inclusive of all countries in the world. It's a development agenda, it's a prosperity agenda. There is no any political attachments. Like uh, AIIB, right? So China has said that even though, you know, China is the largest stakeholder, you know, a shareholder in AIB, but then it is still open, you know. Any, any country can join it. Similarly, I think Belt and Road, it remains open. Certainly, the influence that the Belt and Road countries hold between them is impressive, at over 30% of global GDP and 62% of the population. And the initiative goes beyond the countries along the Silk Routes of old. A total of 126 countries and 29 international organizations have signed BRI cooperation documents with China. As China's economy shifts from high-speed growth to high-quality development, there are some who ask if the Belt and Road is just an answer for Chinese problems. In all economic growth and in all created economic complexity in Ethiopia, is the benefit of such kind of strong cooperation between Ethiopia and China. If this overcapacity, you know, which is in surplus in China and which is in deficit in other Belt and Road countries, so what is the problem? You know? So I don't see any problem. For example, India doesn't produce mobile phones, right? You know, why Vivo, why Oppo, why Johnny, you know, why Huawei? and so on and so forth, they should be doing so good in India. Because India doesn't produce, that. that's how the trade happens, right? The initiative may be helping China overcome its economic challenges, but it benefits other countries too. By 2018, China's outward direct investment into Belt and Road countries amounted to over 60 billion US dollars, creating over 200,000 local jobs. In fact, many countries and regions actively dovetail their own development plans with the BRI, including the EU Juncker Investment Plan and ASEAN's Master Plan for Connectivity. Much of this multilateral cooperation is done with developing countries. So, is this really benefiting them or saddling them with unsustainable debt? Debt trap. If you do not use the resource properly, you may face such kind of trap. The Belt and Road Initiative by itself will not lead any country to debt trap. And that trap is, you know, the easiest excuse, you know, and uh, blaming China for, uh, uh, you know, destroying the economies of the smaller countries. Uh, debt traps only exist when relations between debtors and lenders break down. It's only when people say, you must pay your money back immediately, that you're in a de debt trap. I hope China is a very wise lender, in which case China won't lend too much. It won't lend more than the country's borrowing, not pay back next year, but 
over time eventually will be able to pay back. And in the meantime, in any case, they're giving China the advantage of paying interest on the money they borrow and so on. It's to the advantage of both sides. It's win-win. The latest studies by the World Bank and other international institutions suggest that the BRI cooperation will cut the costs of global trade by 1.1 to 2.2 percent and will contribute at least 0.1 percent of global growth in 2019. With an initiative of this scale, it's natural to have questions. And that's exactly why events like the Belt and Road Forum are so important to open the floor and answer concerns so the international community can develop in a way that works for everyone. See you next time.